You know, I've been running startups for 25 years now, and I don't think I've ever changed anyone's mind. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think I've ever taken someone from like no to yes. We never try to convince anyone. If anyone disagrees with how we do things, that's fine. My recommendation for people's first time is to build for yourself. Well, hi, uh, my name is Phil Libin, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of All Turtles, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm a fifth-time uh, startup founder, so I'm currently on my fifth company. Uh, the company that I'm probably the best known for uh, is called Evernote, and in the middle there, I was a venture capitalist for a couple of years. Uh, you know, I'm not very motivated by starting companies. I'm a refugee, actually. My family came here with my parents to the U.S. from what used to be the Soviet Union as, as refugees uh, in 1979. I was growing up in, uh, in New York City, in the Bronx, in the 80s. It was a pretty dangerous neighborhood back then. I mostly just stayed inside, uh, and I begged my parents to give me a computer. Uh, and so they got me my first computer. It was an Atari 800 XL computer. And that computer was pretty much all I did for, for many years. I just stayed inside and I, I learned how to program the computer and I got onto bulletin boards and I started talking to a lot of people on other computers. This was before I had access to the internet, but it was, it was still very much like eye-opening. I think I had that first sense of agency as a programmer. I realized that when I write a computer program, I'm just taking thoughts and then I do something and it, and it becomes real and I can actually like have, a, have an impact. That's what kind of gave me that first idea that I, I can help build the things that I want to see exist in the world. I never really considered starting a company or, or, or being an entrepreneur. I always thought that you know, I would just get a job. I would just be a, you know, a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or something. I think that's what my parents expected. I couldn't like hold down a real job. Like it, it was easier for me to start something than to uh, be an engineer in a big company or something like that. It always felt like I was failing. It took a while, it took maybe 10 years for me to start thinking of, of this as a positive thing. So it, it wasn't something that I wanted to do. It wasn't something that I like identify as having a drive to start companies. The first company we started was called uh, Engine 5. Uh, we started in 1997. It was really in the middle of the first dot-com bubble. Everyone was just running around saying dot-com, dot-com. You can go to any tree in Boston and you can say dot-com and shake a tree and an investor would fall out of it and give you money. You could do anything if you just figured out how to put things on the internet. So we built some of the very first shopping carts, some of the very first things that let you buy things on the internet. So we were working 16 hours a day, seven days a week, straight. Never, never a weekend, no time off. And then we got an opportunity to sell the company, a much bigger company called Vignette. So we just got really lucky. And then we stayed at Vignette for, for two years. And then we started our second company, which was called Core Street. And that was a security company. And we sold to uh, governments, banks. We did like a big security systems, uh, which was really boring. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The lesson we learned from Engine 5 was that, uh, so because at Engine 5 we were basically consultants. And what we learned from that is that sucks. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's, you, can, you, don't, you can get paid by doing that, you can get paid pretty well, but you're not building anything of value. Like you're just, like that money stops when you stop working. And mm -hmm. so we said, okay, the lesson is we have to build a product. And so at, at the second company, which was Core Street, we said, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna make a product. We're gonna learn that lesson. So we made this product. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact that we got wrong is it was a product that was in a space that nobody, like, Nobody gets, nobody's in love with. No one gets excited about it. Like no one wakes up in the morning and it's like, for banks. yeah, they're like, oh yeah, new new standard for contact smart cards for government employees just came out. <laughs> I bet one guy does. Yeah, it was me. That was me. That was, that was the guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's sad. So the lesson we learned from that was like, yeah, it's not enough to build a product. That's better than being a consultant. But it's not enough to build a product you, because the product isn't for us. Like mm -hmm. we're not a government. We're not a bank. We have to constantly like. I, I, I got so sick of hearing like, remember, Phil, you're not the target customer. In my, my first two companies, we made products for other customers. Uh, we made products for, um, for retailers and for banks and for, for governments. And so we always have to think about what does the customer want? Selling a big thing to like a government agency, it takes like a year just to like get the contracts you know, ready. We ran that company for about six or seven years and then we sold that and then we started Evernote. Evernote definitely wasn't my idea. Evernote was started, uh, there were two companies that came together in uh, 2007. Uh, there was a, a team of people that were led by Stepan Pachikov, who was this uh, brilliant uh, scientist and entrepreneur. He was in uh, Silicon Valley, and then I had a team in Boston. Uh, we had just sold our second company, and we were thinking about what to do next. We never thought about what the customer wants, because we were making the product for ourselves. So we thought, well, what do, what do we want? And we both had this idea to build a an external brain, a cognitive prosthesis, we called it. And, uh, we decided to merge the two companies in 07 and create the new Evernote out of that. It was maybe the oldest idea in technology. We were just going to use technology to help people remember things, to help them be more productive. Uh, the idea was definitely not very original, but most ideas aren't very original. Uh, I think what really matters is the execution, and I think we had, uh, we had very good execution at Evernote.
Your dream is to get it in front of every iPhone user, and hopefully they love it and buy it, right? That's not possible today. Developers don't, most developers don't have those kinds of resources. Even the big developers would have a hard time getting their app in front of every iPhone user. Well, we're gonna solve that problem for every developer, big to small. And the way we're gonna do it is what we call the App Store. We were on the App Store on the very first day. We were one of the first apps uh, that came out uh, back in 2007, 2008, 2009. And lots of the big companies were launching App Stores. We were always one of the first apps, and we became kind of the default productivity app. There was already many note-taking apps. In fact, every device, every computer, every phone, every personal assistant, they all came with free note-taking apps. So it was already like infinite competition. What we tried to do is just to be, to be better than all of them in some very specific ways. For a product to succeed, it needs to be great at something. It's fine if it's not very good in, in a lot of other things, but it needs to be really sharply great at something. At Evernote, we were really great at a couple of things. One was we were the first one to do fully background synchronization. And now you take it for granted, but back then it was a big deal that I could write something on my computer and then if I took out my phone, what I put on my computer was already on my phone and vice versa. You have to think about where your information was. If you wanted to do that before Evernote, you have to really think about uh, setting up synchronization and setting up FTP servers and doing all this work. And Evernote, it was just, it was just magic, it just worked. And another thing we did is we let you search inside of your images. So you could search, for, you could take pictures of business cards or signs and you could search by images. Those two things were really original and they really helped us stand out. And then we just worked really hard to be the best productivity tool in the market. By the time I left Evernote, we had made 400 million users. I mean, everything is difficult in a startup, uh, especially a startup that's growing uh, uh, very quickly. You know, you wake up and there's, there's, there's difficulties nonstop. In fact, it's harder to think of anything that was easy. In the beginning, our big advantage is we were making the product for ourselves. Every time we make a change, you know, we can look to see did it make it better or worse for us. And we knew how to, how to advance the product. So, and that was a huge advantage in the beginning because it was much faster. But that also became a very big difficulty for us later because it became harder to add uh, new users, different types of users. We had really made the product so much for power users like us who had very specific narrow use cases that we had a, a pretty difficult time scaling past that. And we had to try really hard a couple of years into it to make sure that we really understood what other people wanted and how to be uh, useful to them when it came time to grow beyond just ourselves. There were many lessons uh, from Evernote. Um, one of the biggest ones is you need to be very clear your product needs to be very clear about its point of view. Really excellent products, they're not neutral. They have a strong opinion. They have a strong point of view about how you're supposed to use them and what kind of people should use them and how you should structure things. And I think if you try to make a product uh, neutral, if you try to make a product something that really like everyone can use and it doesn't really specify how it should be used, you, it's hard to make something really good. At Evernote, we try to be very clear about what our philosophy was to, to being organized. And also very clear about whose side we were on. I think part of having that point of view is especially for a business product, and most Evernote users use it at work. We have to be very clear about whose side were we on. Were we on the side of the, the, the employee or the company? You know, the company usually paid us, but the actual human beings, the employees, used us. When those interests diverged, we had to decide whose side we were on. And we were always very clear that we were always on the side of the people. We were always on the side of the, of the users, of the humans, even if even if they're not the ones that are paying us, even if the company is the one paying us. And whenever there was a conflict between those two things, we always sided with the people. That was a very important lesson, is to always have a strong point of view and have the product really embody that philosophy and that strong point of view. And don't, don't try to be for everyone. Don't try to be neutral. We, I think, did our part in making the productivity category cool again. I think before us, productivity hadn't really changed much. It was like Microsoft Office. I feel like we were at least partially responsible for this current generation of very cool productivity apps. My recommendation for people's first time is to build for yourself or to build for a community that you already understand really well. So you shouldn't have a question about whether people want it because you should be the world's biggest expert on what whoever you're building for wants. And if you don't understand your own problems or whatever people you're trying to help, if you don't really understand their problems that well, I wouldn't start a company in that space, at least not a first one. I would start the first thing to be something you're already the world's biggest expert on. And then just skip that step completely. Like if you have to wonder whether or not people will actually want your product, it means that you don't understand enough about your, the people you're trying to serve to even have that question. Now, much later, when you're, when you're starting your you know, fifth company, 
uh, or your you know, third product or something, then you, know, you can be different. But in the beginning, I would say, look, there's so many things to work on. Just make it easy on yourself and pick something that you already know is going to be in high demand. Anytime you do anything important, you have to change people's views. You have to change behavior. That's not a problem. That's an opportunity. All successful products or companies got to be successful because they asked people to change their behavior in some way. And you don't have to get everyone to change their behavior. You don't even have to get most people to change their behavior. You only have to get enough of the people that you need. So we never try to convince anyone. If anyone disagrees with how we do things, that's fine. There's enough people who like this approach and who already want to do it. And so I'd much rather spend my energy in any company. I'd much rather spend my energy on finding people who already like it and getting them really excited. That's a better use of energy than finding people who don't like it and trying to change their mind. You know, I've been running startups for 25 years now, and I don't think I've ever changed anyone's mind. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think I've ever taken someone from like no to yes. I always take people from yes to yeah, definitely.